attention to the 22nd chapter of Genesis. It was pointed out to me I don't preach a lot from Genesis, and I guess that's the truth. But today our lesson will focus on one of the great stories of this book of beginnings. Beginning with the first verse. Now, it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. And offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. And took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering. And arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to the young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to, his, to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. May the Lord today add his blessings to the reading of his word. From the moment he took his first breath, from the very time that his feeble cry was heard coming from the tent of Sarai, he was and would always be the object of his father's love. This little boy embodied the fulfillment of God's promise to this aged couple, to Abraham and his beautiful wife, which also was his half-sister, by the way. Her name in the beginning was Sarai. With the birth of this little boy, this aged woman was transformed from a woman scorned and ridiculed into a woman blessed by God. The Bible says that Abraham believed God Abraham obeyed God. Though the thought of a man a hundred years old having a son was ridiculous. 
It was laughable. As a matter of fact, it was hysterical. When Sarah overheard the news that this strange couple brought to the tent of Abraham, news that within a year he would be the father of a son, she laughed. Ha! Well, she laughed within herself, but the strange messengers heard her. Why did you laugh, Sarah? Oh, I didn't laugh. She said, oh, yes, you did. Well, your son's name will be Isaac. You know what the word Isaac means? Laughter. Laughter. Of course it was laughter. It was hilarious that a child would be born to this couple. Abraham was now a, a centurion. And Sarah was 90-plus when this blessed event occurred. But there was more, you know. He was also the human conduit who, which God had promised that he would bless the entire world. He had made it clear to Abraham, it was not through Ishmael, your son by Hagar, but through Isaac, your son by Sarah, that all the world would be blessed. Can you imagine the joy that came to this elderly couple's life when this little boy was born? When proud Abraham was holding his son in his hands, it would have been as if he was holding his great-grandson or even his great-great-grandson. But he wasn't looking at his great-great-grandson. He was looking at his son. Every time he cooed, every time he smiled, Every time he tried to take a step and he stumbled and fell, there would have been a mingled joy. And as the days passed, he grew stronger and smarter. And if possible, with every passing day, Abraham and his wife Sarah loved him more. You know, it's really rather rare for the Bible to reveal that one person loved another. It's only said a few times, really. The Bible said, for example, that Jesus loved his disciples. And John deliberately says that Jesus loved Lazarus. It is also said of Jesus that he loved a young man that came to him with a question. David loved Jonathan, that is true. But here in this scripture, God deliberately says that Abraham loved his son Isaac of all the people who had ever lived. As we would say in the way we say things today, Abraham literally loved the ground this, this little boy walked on. Bill Cosby said when his kids were little, when they soiled their diapers, it didn't smell. And then they got older. And then it smelled really bad. I doubt if Abraham ever noticed. He loved him so much. Every time he saw his son, he remembered the promise that God had made to him long ago. Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. Then the years passed one by one. You know how they accumulate. And his 80s became his 90s and his 91 and 92 and 93. Until finally at 100 years old, God shows up and says, Now, Abraham, now I'm going to fulfill my promise. You see, in the Jewish culture, in the Hebrew culture, there was one person in a man's life that he loved more than his wife. You know who it was? His son. A man loved his son even above the love 
of his wife. It was the supreme love in his life. It was his responsibility and his joy to teach him the law, to teach him a trade, because if he didn't teach him a trade, he taught him to steal. When he was eight days old, Abraham took his son and circumcised him. Now he was in covenant with God. You would have thought that life could have gotten no better for Abraham and his aged wife, Sarah. Then it happened. I don't know if it was in the middle of the day or the middle of the night. But Abraham heard a familiar voice. Abraham? And Abraham answered, Here I am. You know, Isaiah would answer God in very much the same way. When Isaiah was, saw God high and lifted up, and God's train filled the temple, and the foundations of the temple shook, and then God began to speak, Who will go for us? Remember what Isaiah said, Here am I. And then Moses, when he was up on the mountain, and he saw a bush that burned but was not consumed, a voice came from that bush, Moses, Moses. Well, now Abraham hears that voice. And the voice says, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I tell you. The author of Genesis spares us the details of that night. But can you imagine what happened that night in Abraham's tent? His body literally must have convulsed in pain. He must have lied there in a twisted mess. Oh, God. How can I do this? How can I do this? You know, Abraham could be a violent man. When his nephew Lot was kidnapped, he got together a few hundred men and went off searching for him. Today we would have called in the army rangers. Abraham didn't need them. He went his own self and he rescued his nephew Lot and he brought him back. But now the enemy that Abraham faced was not flesh and blood, not one that could be defeated by the edge of the sword. Now Abraham was struggling with the voice within himself. If only I could die. If only I could die. God, if only it was me. Why not me? I'm nearly a hundred years. I'm over a hundred years old. I've lived out my days. Take me. At least the last thing I would see would be my son Isaac. And I would know that my lineage would go on. Kill me, God. At least then I would know that your promise is still true. But how would he do this? How would he kill his own son? How would he kill his own child? If it, even if he could reconcile his broken heart to what God had said, how then would the promise of God be fulfilled? None of this makes any sense. God had said that it would through Isaac, not Ishmael. Try if you can to imagine how he felt that night. I wouldn't have been him in that tent for all the money in the world. 
I, I don't know when it happened. I don't know how it happened. But some time during that horrible agony, Abraham was able to make up his mind. I doubt if he a actually spoke it out loud, the conclusion he came to. The author of Hebrews gives us insight into what was going on in his head. Because finally on that night, somehow, some way, Abraham decided, I am going to obey God. I'm going to obey God. And God can raise my son from the dead. We look on that now as an awesome thing that Abraham did, this act of obedience and faith. As a matter of fact, Jews and Christians and Muslims all around the world look to this man with respect and admiration because by faith, Abraham found a way to obey God and then leave the consequences up to God himself. So now this aged man, who must have aged a lifetime in his tent that night, prepares to set out for Moriah. It was way to the north. It was the defining moment in his life. You know, after this, Joshua would gather the leaders of Israel together, and he would say, Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of the Amorites or the Hittites or some other ites that lived in your land, or the gods that you served on the other side of the flood, the great river. You choose, but for me and my house, we choose the Lord. Many years after that, Oh, Elijah would stand on Mount Carmel, and he would gather the people together. And he would say to them, how long will you go on? And boy, this is a great word. How long will you go on? What does it say? How long will you hesitate between two opinions. In the King James translation, it says, how long will you halt between two opinions? And I, I have read over that word and read over that word and read over that word. And I think in my mind, I simply thought, well, it meant that they were trying to decide. That's what halt means. No, that's not what halt means. What does halt mean? It means to It means to limp. The halt and the blind and the lame, it means to limp. Literally what, what Elijah was saying to them is, how long will you keep on limping between these two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But how did the people answer? They didn't, did they? They stood there, still limping. But Abraham wasn't given this option. He couldn't limp any longer. Either he would choose to obey God, or God would be nothing to him. And he was forced to decide that night in his tent. What is the highest love in your life? What is the highest love in your life? In Abraham's life, it was his son. The relationship between a man and his son was intended to be the highest of all relationships. A man's goal was to reproduce himself by teaching his son the trade, but also finding him a wife, and then also teaching him the law. An Orthodox Jew to this day, his goal is to teach his son the law, the Torah, by the time he is six. To teach him the first five books of the Bible by the time he is 12. And I don't mean just teach it. Memorize it. 
What is he doing? He's reproducing himself. Which is exactly the concept of discipleship. The idea of discipleship is based on the relationship between a father and his son. Abraham loved his son. It would have been the highest love in his life. So God said to Abraham, go kill your son and offer him to me. I want you to notice at this point that it was a test, but it was a test that Abraham passed. Some have said, oh, Abraham knew that God would rescue him. No, he did not. The Bible is very clear on that point. No, he did not. What was God really leading Abraham to do in his tent that evening? Well, I think the answer can be found in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He wants what we all want, doesn't he? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to Jesus, or he said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth up. Looking on him, Jesus felt a love for him. And said to him, oh, one thing you lack. Let me say to you clearly, and let me say this to you in a way you will understand. If you're trying to earn your way into heaven, there will always be something you lack. One thing you lack, he said, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But at these words, the Bible said he was saddened. He went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. What did Jesus really want this man to do? At the end of the story of Abraham, Abraham learned that God provided. Abraham, though he was rich, came to understand that he owned nothing, not even his son. Especially not even his son. Yet this poor man became very, very rich so rich towards God that God actually said, of all the people living, this man gets special favor. He will be called my friend. Now, he was not perfect. As a matter of fact, Abraham could flat out be a scoundrel. But he was rich. Yet this rich man was very poor. So for, poor, in fact, that he went away grieving. You see, there was something in his life that he needed to kill and offer to God as a sacrifice, but he simply couldn't do it. His things became his God, and in turn, his God enslaved him. Instead of him having joy, that's what he thought his riches would bring him, he found only grief. On the other hand, Abraham was filled with joy because he believed and obeyed God, and in turn, God gave him back his son. Isn't that what Jesus meant when he said, If any man will follow after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
For whosoever will save his life will lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Paul got it when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives within me. So again, we are left with the question, what is the highest love in your life? What do you love more than anything else? Whatever it is, the day will come, and maybe this is the day for you, when God will say, kill it and offer it to me. Don't just let it die. Kill it and offer it to me. What is the highest love Jesus looked at his disciples one time and he said, if any man will follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Abraham remained a very wealthy man as far as how many cattle he had and how many children he would have and how much money he had. But from this moment on, Abraham was a poor man who was very rich towards God. As we stand and sing to